I was um, sharing with this, the first service that um, coming upon this passage of scripture about Jesus welcoming the children, this should be like sort of easy area for the pediatrician to come and handle this. Um, but, but God often takes me in a different way than I would have expected, that I would have thought I would have taught this. Um, and even this morning, I was telling Kim, uh, we, we have an expression in our house, when, especially on Sunday mornings, when, that I'll say I'm in the weeds. And it's, um, I, I'm not sure this is all coming together as I had hoped it would come together as the talk, clock, is, and I'm on my fifth revision this morning and going, well, nope, that, nope, this neat, nope, that, you know, all these kinds of things. Um, and I, I was talking to Kim about that. I was like, wow, where God has taken me on this is a very interesting place um, uh, where he, I feel like he wants to concentrate. But uh, even as we were coming in and during the first service, um, Dave prayed that God would, that God would lead. And I, and I felt him filling in the blanks that I didn't understand how he was going to do it. Um, and part of that is, is that when I teach the Word of God, it's not without recognizing where we are in our society and what is going on in our world. Um, and I'm always um, pleasantly surprised when I see where God has us in His Scriptures and how that relates to events that may be going on. I, I thought that probably the first song we sang today there is no song that our, the church of Christ needs to hear more than that song. It talks about chaos and where is our hope and where are we putting things, right? No matter where it is, it, that we, it comes back to Christ. Right? Um, <clears throat> and some of you um, may have seen uh, an incident over the weekend that has caused much discussion. Um, um, and as I thought about this in terms of uh, the mocking of our, of our Savior and mocking of communion on a world stage, um, it, it reminded me of Psalm 3, where it says, O Lord, how my adversaries have increased. Many are rising up against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no deliverance for him in God. Uh, they're, they're mocking the hope that we have in, in Jesus Christ. Um, on one of the most televised events in, the, in a year. And as I was, as I was thinking about that, is, is even as we're raising children, as we're doing this, this is happening in the place where there is more chaos and things that we have once held very dear are, are being mocked by society. Um, and it brought me to um, what God calls us to do in the midst of everything, what he brings us back to. And it comes from Galatians 6, where it says, bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But each one must examine his own work and then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone and not in regard to another. For each one will bear his own load. The one who is taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will, we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who are in the household of faith. As I was thinking about these, these passages, um, as the world's love grows cold, and it seems like the enemies are rising up against us, there will be many more who will have a chance to show love that they in no way deserved receiving. And I think as we consider that, of how we welcome people into our lives, 
And we welcome people who don't necessarily deserve to be in our lives, who have no special place to demand a presence in our lives. I think if we come to now the verses we're going to read, that's what God has shown me to teach. So please stand with me as we read uh, Mark 10. We're going to be looking at four verses, 13 through 16. And just for a preview, if you're struggling with materialism, next week on chapter 10, we'll be doing the rich young ruler. So just if you like, you need some tune-up on the materialism, you're welcome. So chapter 10 of Mark, verse 13, and they were bringing children to him so that he might touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. And when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, permit the children to come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it at all. And he took them in his arms and began blessing them, laying his hands on them. The goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith, as it says in 1 Timothy 1.5. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. Lord, let it go out in your power, directed by the Holy Spirit to each of us so we may learn and be transformed by it. We ask this, Father, praying in accordance with your Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus, our blessed and risen Christ. Amen. You can be seated. So I usually don't give a precursor on how I'm going to teach a passage, but today I, I think it's necessary to help you understand where I, I'm going. And, and first is to talk about the wonder of children. Children have an, an incredible ability to look at things in wonder, like everything is, is new. And they're trying to figure out the world, especially as they get to that place in life where they can start articulating their questions and what's going on. It's amazing. I love that time where they can start asking those questions like three to four, and they're trying to put it all together. Um, um, it, but if we look at children just who they are, as we look at them physically and we watch them develop um, emotionally how they develop, as each child has its own personality, God has given them a personality for the purpose that God created them for. Right? It's not just their physical stature that he's given them, but he's also given them the emotional stature that will direct them in different paths. Right? He will have some who will be very meek. He will have some who will be warriors. He has all the in-betweens. But each one's child's, their emotional, of the, um, the very essence of what their personality is, I believe, is God-given. Right? And then there's also the spiritual in terms of how children take in what they are taught about the things of God. Because when they start seeing things, they have, it was just like question, why? Why is this? Why? 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 And you know, for the three, when you have a three to five year old, you're just like, if they ask me one more why question, right? it's time for a babysitter, please. Because <laughs> they're just, why? 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 Why do you do that? Why do you do that? Why do you do that? The, the other thing I wanted to talk about, so one is the wonder, we have to understand who children are, that Jesus is pointing them out, like this is actually your guide more than the Pharisee. So the Pharisees are saying, we're going to lead you, we're the leaders. But Jesus is saying, actually, if you look at what the children do, they're actually much closer to the ideal than what the Pharisees who are claiming to be the ideal and have all the ropes. And we often relegate the lesser of status to a position that lacks preference and honor. Jesus talked about this all the time. He talked about, why are you letting the person sit in the place of honor Right? Why do you want that place? Why don't you give that up? Someone else can have that. But the Pharisees, they wanted the place of honor. They thought, we deserve this. And even you can see there's this tendency to, um, oh, well, I don't have time for you. When someone tells you they might not have time for you, they might ha not have time for you, but they might have time for someone who's more important than you. Because if they could, there are things that, I think of the expression when people say, oh, I'll drop everything. 
Well, there are people in your life who you'll drop everything for. And then there are people in your life who you won't drop everything for. And a lot of it depends on how important loving them, pleasing them is to how you're looking at your whole life. It's very stark to say that, but it's very honest of who are we willing to drop everything for? Because Jesus is going to ask us to drop everything for even the people we don't like and even those people we call our enemies. So I want to talk about that in terms of how children deal with lesser and greater and how we deal with that. And then the third thing I want to talk about is, is, is what is he trying to teach us about how we welcome people and how we welcome children? Why was that so important back then? Because children are really quite marvelous little beings. There's something special about children, even sick ones. They're, they're just amazing. I, I've used this quote many, many times when I give talks like at, at um, medical conferences. Um, Charles Dickens once wrote, I, I love these little ones, and it is no small thing when those who are so fresh from God love us. Um, Charles Dickens was the one who wrote the Christmas story, and he's a very fascinating. Um, there's a story about, about um, what Christmas would be like if Dickens had not written the Christmas story, and it tells, it sort of shows how crazy his mind was to come up with the Christmas story, and to come up with all the different names and where he got Scrooge from, um, and, uh, and the Christmas story is not a fanciful tale of material gifts that we sort of associate Christmas now, right? It's Christmas is now associated when the season starts to stop shopping for Christmas gifts, right? But it was a story about how the, the love of God can descend upon us and um, descend upon the nastiest person and do miraculous transformations to do things that nobody would think that this person could ever be transformed. What G.K. Chesterton had to say about Dickens was interesting. Uh, he said, he left a will commending his soul to God and to the mercy of Jesus Christ. What a beautiful thing to put in your will. And leaving his works to the judgment of posterity, and in both respects, the action was symbolic and will remain significant in history. He goes on to say, he was at heart traditional and was drawn much more towards Anglican than Puritan Christianity. And his greatest work may yet prove to be the perpetuation of the joyful mystery of Christmas. I think um, Christmas always fascinated me as a, as, a, as a very young child, and it seemed like it took forever to get to Christmas. Forever. It get, took forever before I could watch the good claymation Christmas stories on the three channels we had in our blue and gray TV. Right? Um, but I think it's because it has some beautiful, the, the Christmas story, even as it's presented in our society, it has this idea that free gifts are being, being delivered by someone with, with, with uh, un, unlimited love. Um, and that gospel theme runs through it. If, if we can, and if we can hold on to the purity of being given, given to freely due to a beautiful love that is sacrificial, sort of anonymous, that the person never gets anything back for it. You know, it's, it's beautiful. And so they, they, they were bringing children to him so that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked them. So these were parents who were bringing their children to Jesus. These are parents who thought it was important to get Jesus to touch them, to bless them. If you remember back how important blessings were, if you think about with Isaac and Joseph, it was very important for the father figure to lay his hand on the child or the son and say a blessing for them. It was very important in terms of how the hands were, how the hands went, and if it was done in the right way, and who was who was given the first blessing, and who was given the second blessing. All this was very important, and it spoke to who they would become. 
It was prophetic in terms of the blessing of who, who are they going to become. Um, and, and this is just this idea that they were bringing children to him was just like Hannah bringing Samuel to the temple to be dedicated. And remember, the, the story of Hannah is one of those remarkable stories that you just, you, you just go, really, Hannah did this? Because remember, she was barren, and she longed to have a, a child. And remember, she was made fun of because she was barren. And so God finally says, next year you will have a baby. He comes to her in a dream. And because she, she, what does Hannah mean? Cries out to God. And so she was allowed to have a child. And so she has beautiful Samuel. And the Bible says is after he was weaned, she took him and gave him in service of the Lord in the temple to be raised by Eli. So no matter how you look at it, this is somewhere this child was somewhere between one and five, probably depending on when they decided it was officially, baby was officially weaned. But what a remarkable story of not only dedicating this child, but coming and saying, he's yours. So this is what the families were doing with these children. But the disciples decided, important people only. Well, this person could be healed. Okay, that's a, okay, we'll let them see Jesus. Okay, well, if you're the right kind of person, we want one of those crazy people on the side of the road, right? Shut up, that's Jesus coming. No, he's only, but the centurion or someone who have high esteem, yeah, yeah, we, that's important enough to get to Jesus. So you see the disciples are sort of like somehow putting people like, no, you can see him and you can see him. They're trying to sort of say who can see Jesus and Jesus is saying, No. But as I think about children, they are of utmost importance because they represent to us what we are to God. The family, the way God has put it together, the unconditional love of the mother, the father feeling like he has to protect his family. Right? A child having absolute trust in the mother, being nourished by it. All those things are important for us to understand how God looks at us. I remember that, that um, I had a hard time understanding what a father's love was, my heavenly father's love was to me until I had Drew. And what helped me with Drew is he's adopted. And so, so I just, I just it, it makes so much sense to me as I think of myself as an adopted by God and as his family. Now I have this son in front of me. And he, all he did was, like I, I've said before, all he did was wake me up, <laughs> pee, some hellacious diapers I had to clean, got all in his circumcision thing and everything like that. I was just like, oh my gosh, this is taking so much longer. I realized it took me now like 20 minutes just to go out the door. Like that three minute trip to 7-Eleven, which was across, across the street now takes 20 minutes. And like, I had to, I remember I had like seven diapers, whole things. You're going to 7-Eleven, Kirk. Well, just in case, you know. <laughs> but, um, when I thought he might have some major defect, um, I cried over him. But he had done nothing good for me. He hadn't. I mean, we consider babies adorable, but he hadn't done anything. He didn't say, you know, wave, hi, Dad, on TV or anything. He hadn't done anything for me. Okay? <laughs> dads get ripped off on that, by the way, because dads are usually the ones who help the kids in sports. But then Mom, hi, Mom. You know, just, but you know, on a different day, I'll, I'll let that bitterness go down for today and talk about other things. <laughs> Never know what's going to come out on Sunday morning. You really don't. Yeah, neither do I, guys. Really. <laughs> um, but, you know, children, they, 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 they come to us with this incredible freshness. Their skin is so soft and fragile. 
right? Baby skin, right? There's like something about baby skin, little baby's toes, little feet. They're just like, it's like the freshest, most pure little thing. Um, because we catch it before it became, becomes calloused, don't we? It's a big difference between reaching out and shaking a hand of a construction guy and feel the beautiful little toes of a baby. And this is also true of a child's emotions. They're so soft, and, and if we catch them before they've gotten hardened for reasons with lies and betrayals and hurts, they have a beautiful purity even in, in their smiles. I love children because, especially the small ones, they'll only smile if they really are happy. They, they haven't learned the fake smile. They, they haven't learned any of that. They haven't learned to deceive you with their smile yet. Right? They, they, the child is very honest with you about how they're feeling. They're, and the amazing thing is their emotions are on like a, this incredible chart like this. Because right? you know the child, while they're crying and have these giant tears, can go immediately to a smile and laugh, and then three seconds later go right back to crying with tears. Right? But you realize, oh, okay, they were happy. Oh, no, really sad. Oh, wait, happy again. Right? But there's an honesty and a beauty about their emotions. Um, um, I, I, watched, I, I watched this happen with Drew. I watched the development of his fake smile. So it was between his third and fourth birthday. And the third birthday, I have a picture of him, and he had a smile that brightened a room. I mean, just these beautiful white teeth and a big, huge smile and eyes glistening with joy. And then between his third and his fourth birthday, he was suffered a horrible betrayal. And a year later, when we took his fourth birthday picture, his face showed the same smile and the same beautiful teeth. But... There was something missing in his eyes. And when he heard smile, Drew, he knew exactly what to do. But his eyes no longer smiled. That pure trust, that pure joy was gone. So when Jesus hears what the disciples did, in verse 14 it says, but when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, permit the children to come to me, do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Um, I think a lot of times we have all these ideas of who Jesus was and what he was like, but the Bible actually tells us we just ignore some of the verses. You have people saying, well, Jesus would never be mad at you. Um, sounds like there were some ways you could make Jesus mad, at least indignant, right? Last thing I would want to know, Kim and Kurt, uh, sorry, Drew and Kim say that there is a, um, the Kirk Melhone um, look of disdain. Drew thinks it can actually kill people if used in high enough concentrations. <laughs> um, I don't know how indignant Jesus was toward these people, but it was pretty clear that he was not happy with what they had done to these parents who had brought these kids to see him. Um, and he makes it pretty clear. He says, permit the children to come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. So what he is saying is, is, I know you guys think that I need to see only these people or these people or these people, but children, I want them to come to me. And these families who are asking me for me to bless their children, that I have some power that I can bless their children, I, they are acknowledging me as who I am, and I want those kids to come so I can bless them. And when Jesus says something, this is something we need to take note of. And I think the children are just an example to us as the lesser of people that we run into in our lives. Well, okay, I have time for you, but not you. Okay, I have time for you, but not you. So who's that calling? 
You know what is very interesting to me? What one of the main responses I get when people call me? You answer your own phone. I said, well, this is my phone. <laughs> <laughs> and they go, oh, and it's, they're, they're like, they were ready to talk to someone else. And I was like, well, uh, well, you called me. Well, I didn't think I was going to talk to you. Well, you are. <laughs> to me, I was like, we can, okay, we can get on with it. We could keep talking about how you're surprised. It's me. I feel like they're wait, waiting for like two or three different objects of ver verification. Like I've got to give my birth date, my last four, my social or something like that. It's like, no, it's me. We can just talk now. Um, but this idea of are they worthy of coming to me? Jesus had some pretty strong parables about how we treated other people and if they were worth it or not. Brooke, the book of Hebrews warns us, be careful how you treat the strangers because they might be angels unaware. Right? You've probably heard the story when the, when the visiting pastor or the, the up-and-coming pastor, um, sort of like the week before he started, he came in and dressed up as a homeless person and came to the church. It's very telling on how he was treated in terms of what he had to teach the church. He was now becoming their shepherd. So as, as children are such a beautiful example that, that God cares for very carefully, we need to remember that he might command us to do things about people that we would much rather ignore and feel justified that they don't deserve our time. In Hosea 14, 9, it says, whoever is wise, whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the righteous will walk in them, but transgressors will stumble in them. So Jesus has now made a command on how we are to treat lesser people who don't have a lot of maybe emotional significance. They might not have any financial significance in our lives. How are we to treat them when they come to us? Well, Jesus made it very clear in John 14 when he said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, but it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be with you. Jesus is commanding us to love others, including the lessers and even our enemies, which will demonstrate our love for him. It will demonstrate our love for him because if we love him, he will transform us with his Holy Spirit, which is the only way that we would be able to love enemies and love our lessers as he would have us love them. Martin Lloyd Jones, I, I, I've always liked him, and I like him a little bit more now that he, I knew when I found out he was a doctor before he was a pastor. I feel like, oh, okay, he could do it. Maybe I. Um, but Martin Lloyd Jones said this, and I, and I loved how he handled the Word of God. So when he was teaching seminary students, they could not look at a commentary. All they had was the Word of God. So everything they needed to do had to work in and read, and read, 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 read the Word of God and try to find whether an idea they had was supported by the whole council of God in Scripture. But this, is, this sort of goes along with what I was talking about last, last week about letting the Scripture be over your authority rather than you be authority over Scripture. This is what he said. God does not want our opinions on His laws. They are not to be discussed. They are to be kept. They are not even to be applauded. They are to be applied. And I, when I read that, I thought about how many times that, that I thought I have, I have my own opinions on God's laws. Laws that I think, or maybe this is a lesser one, so I'm going to ignore and just trust it under Jesus' grace. Oh, this one I really is a big deal to me. Have you noticed that, that we all have sort of like our laws that we think are the, are the bigger ones, and then we usually beat the people up with that one, but then they could come and get us on another one with their favorite one, and they could beat us up with that one? Nobody? Okay, I'll go on. <laughs> that must have been for the uh, viewing audience. They, these people had nothing to do with that. They're really great with that. But you guys, you guys need to take that home. Okay. 
here's someone going, oh my gosh, he's speaking to me. <laughs> I like how Spurgeon once, he did that little kid thing where he was listening to, you know, kids sneak up. And every one of those kids want to sneak up and want to hear what the adult conversation is. It's usually like that, like that, that like nine to 12 or so, 13, before they think we're idiots and they don't want to talk to their parents. But there's that window where they're very curious and they want to be at the adult table, right? And, and they're sort of like, Hanging out and, you know. Um, but Spurgeon was doing that with his mother one time, and, and, but he caught her when she was praying. And she caught her when he was, she, she was praying about him. And he said, then came a mother's prayer, and some of the words of a mother's prayer we shall never forget, even when our hair is gray. I remember on one occasion her praying thus, now, Lord, If my children go on in their sins, it will not be from ignorance that they perish. And my soul must bear a witness against them at that day of judgment if they lay not hold of Christ. He said, that thought of a mother's bearing swift witness against me pierced my conscience and stirred my heart. He said, it is especially important to bring Jesus bring children to Jesus when we remember they have a whole life in front of them to serve God with. Will you be very angry if I say that a boy is more important, is more worth saving than a man? It is infinite mercy on God's part to save those who are 70. For what good can they do now with the burnt end of their lives? You know, Spurgeon always had a way with words, right? When we get to be 50 or 60, we are almost worn out. I'll give you a witness for that one. (laughs) And if we have spent all of our early days with the devil, what remains for God? But these dear boys and girls, there is something to be made out of them. If now they yield themselves to Christ, they may have a long, happy, and holy day before them in which they may serve God with all their hearts. Who knows what glory God may have of them Heathen lands may, be, may call them blessed. Whole nations may be enlightened by them. The children, we may consider them a lesser, but they are worthy of our time and instruction because of what is before them. To be able to set them on a proper path. For Jesus to be able to pray over them, bless them. To have parents like Brian and Kaylee who are willing to have their daughter dedicated to the Lord and ask the church to come alongside and help raise her. That's great wisdom asking God, will you, will you use this beautiful daughter? Can we instruct her in your ways that we can help her learn from so many others' mistakes that she won't have to go down that road? I want to encourage all, your, all the parents and all the kids, a boring testimony is a thing to be praised. Oh, I have a boring pra- testimony. Praise God. <laughs> For those of us who have left less than boring testimonies, we don't glory in that. What we do is we glory in the grace of Jesus Christ. And even though we're still completely forgiven, we're no we're forgiven, we still have a twinge. Oh, I wish I wouldn't have. But we need help before we, for us to be transformed, and that's the Holy Spirit in our life. To be able to come to God with the purity of a child, with all of our scars, right? I was telling you about these, these kids, right? If, they, if we scar them, Kim and I, are, we can't take care of so many children, and especially since Kim has to take children back to very traumatic events. Right? She has to take back to kids who will have spine surgeries and heart surgeries and liver transplants and brain surgeries. She has to do all that. Right? So what do we do? We try to do everything we can so a child doesn't remember the trauma because we know we can change their personality if we do that to a child. An adult just has a bad story, but a child, we can change the very who they are. We can make them nervous and neurotic if we traumatize them too much. But what is so good about God is what man breaks and what man destroys and what man roughs up, God can come in with his beautiful healing salve and the Holy Spirit who can transform us so we can say, whoever's in Christ, old things have passed away and new things have come. 
We can be, it is his job to transform us, to take us out of the miry clay and then transform us and clothe us in his righteousness. And one of the ways he does it, which is still unbelievable to me that this is his plan, is he makes us who are believers a, a temple of his very Holy Spirit. It's why he can say, I will never leave you or forsake you because his Holy Spirit resides in us. In verse, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, it says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? What we need to do is pray, God, will you help us with those enemies and those people we think aren't worth our time and weren't worth our love? Will you help us to have a love for them that doesn't make sense to the world but, but makes sense to you? Why should we have love for our enemies? Because we were once enemies of God. And in Romans 5, in verse 10, it says, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Jesus invited us, beckoned us to come, drew us. The Father drew us to his son while we were yet sinners. Obviously, for all of us here, he died well before we were born he died before we were actively sinning, purposely ignoring the commandments of God. What's very interesting is I watch a lot of children play. I love to watch children. I love to watch them play. I like their rules and how they come up with things and how they sort things out. And and really, children have an amazing ability to, to love, to trust, and to forgive. We were at a birthday party last night, and I saw these kids who, I've watched these kids get brutal with each other. And now they're back together. Oh, okay, cool. My best friend's here. You know, the best friend, you came crying out of, the, out of the little sandbox with him like two weeks ago, you know, because he brutalized you so badly. But now, back to best friends, Right? They have this ability, incredible ability to trust us as, as parents. They don't ask a lot of questions. Not early. Where are we going? We're gone. Okay. It's amazing when we take a child in the hand, a lot of times what we're taking them and they're just happy as could be as we walk they don't know they're going to chemotherapy or they don't know they're going to get heart surgery. The second time they will. Right? But they have such incredible ability to trust. I love that idea of when, when Kim and I take a baby from their parents' arms, and we know what, what's going to happen next. We know that it's going to be painful. We know what surgery is and what's going to hurt and what's, how long it's going to hurt. and what's gonna, we, we know that even if it has a great outcome, there's going to be some pain for that child. That child has no idea what the pain was. But I love it that that's... I, I love it that we... Jesus' example is he never lied to us about what was happening. He never said, don't worry, if you follow me, everything's going to be great and there are no problems. What did he say to us? Yeah, if you follow me, they're going to be, yeah, you're going to have some tribulations, right? You're going to have to be willing to pick up your cross and follow me. But, but don't worry, I've overcome everything and I have a great plan, right? I, I love it that Jesus, Jesus never lied to us about what, what it was. He said, I want you to come and follow me. I want you to deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. I, I'm not going to lie to you. It's going to be hard, but you don't have the burden of your salvation. I will carry all that for you. You just have to trust me on, on this journey. I'm taking you down to use you for my glory. But we see this in the, in the whole history of, of, of G Jesus' 
and God dealing with the people they're, they're interacting with in terms of even his chosen people, the Israelites, they were made slaves by the Egyptians, given a horrible burden of what they had to do each day. And then there came a time when God rescued them and took them out. And in Exodus 12, 37, it says, Now the sons of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, about 600,000 men on foot, aside from children, and, and a mixed multitude also went up with them, along with flocks and herds and a very large number of livestock. Their enemies were allowed to come with them. Remember, if they wanted to follow and be a part of the the Israeli way of life that was very much centered on what, what God was asking them to do. They were welcome. When you see Judah and Israel, they had this great conflict over who was right. And rather than being one united Israel, they, they set apart from the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom. There was Israel and Samaria, which divided over where sacrifices could be made, whether it was Jerusalem or where they could do it up in Samaria. Then there was Jonah and the Ninevites. Jonah, Jonah's story is so good because if we look at it, it's just like us. There are people that we don't want to help. Well, they got themselves into that on their own. Well, they certainly deserve that. So did the Ninevites, Ninevites deserve stuff from God, like punishment from God? Yeah, what did, he, what did he say? Well, if you repent, I'll clear it all. And Jonah goes, I don't want to give that news. I don't want those people to be forgiven. I'm not going to go to those people, those lesser people, those enemies. Okay. You can fight with God if you want, Jonah. Enjoy some whale time. <laughs> Just in case for you wondering, because I don't want to... I don't want you guys to be concerned that somehow that, that was a fanciful story that's just Kurt talking about magical stuff and, and things. Um, there have been two cases of men that were, were got out of whales, by the way. M many more dogs that were got out. One guy did pretty well after he got out of the whale. Another guy, he, uh, he, uh, another guy didn't do so well. <laughs> he, um, yeah, there's a place in a sperm whale that basically it's like in their stomach, it goes back up above and there's a place where a man can basically stand up. It's outside the stomach. Yeah, there have been there's reports that guys were harpooners and they, there was this they, their dog had fallen up over overboard, and when they harpooned this whale and brought him back in, they heard a dog barking from inside the whale, and they pulled him out. So, yeah, all those stories are told. If you look at Javer and McGee's uh, commentary on Jonah, he describes them all and the and the person who went around the guy who didn't do so well after being swallowed by the whale. Um, yeah, he was he went around like with carnival shows for a while, but he was never right. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know where where he was supposed to go that he didn't go, but <laughs> um, but all these stories and even the Jewish believers. Remember when the Gentiles became believers? It, it, Paul had to go back and have a talk with all the apostles because they were thinking, well, wait a minute. These Gentiles are being able to become believers and they don't have to get circumcised. It's a raw deal. Why do we have to get circumcised? They had this big, huge argument over whether these guys could really come back and were they really receiving the Holy Spirit or not, right? Well, they didn't do it quite right. So they don't get to be on the same team. But we have a lot of this. You don't get to be on the same team. You don't get to be in the same tribe. And Jesus is saying, I want you to bring these people in. And I want children to show you that these are the, in, in this culture, they're not very highly thought of, but I want, do not prevent them from coming to me. What is it about that when it, when it says this, when it says, when it talks about um, um, how he looks at the children, um, what is it about the children that, that are so, that's so special to God? Well, they, they believe easily. The children are, and belief is what pleases God. And true belief transforms us. True belief transforms our actions, both directly and indirectly through the power of this Holy Spirit. 
But the stories of the Bible are captivating to children. They don't care how they're presented, felt boards, whatever, movies. I remember Drew would like, I would tell him, he would go, Dad, read me the story about David and Goliath again. Boys, they love the story of David and Goliath. Right? There are swords involved and someone's head getting cut off. This is a great story, right? <laughs> we would read that again and again. The problem is, is if you ever read the story of David and Goliath to your children, and like in a real Bible, that takes a long time. I mean, it goes on and on. I'm thinking, this is going to be over. <laughs> you know, like parents reading their story. This is going to be, let's, let's pr- choose a different book for the kids tonight. <laughs> hey, I want to read that book. Oh, how about this one? Um, but the, the kids, um, Malcolm Gladwell talks about this in his um, book, David and Goliath. Uh, um, and he talks about how we, def- we really want at n- nature, we want to default to truth that people aren't lying to us. And children are very much so. They default to truth. If, if something's told to them, they want to believe it, especially if it's from someone they really trust. So, but part of the problem is that they believe that we're telling them the truth until they catch us in a lie. And part of that is because we lie to children with stories then we eventually have to tell them it's just a story. When we tried really hard to make them believe as we carried out this grand deception. So our our culture has stories about cash for teeth. We We have stories about golden eggs, chocolate, and fertile, very fertile animals with baskets. And we have one of a jolly fat man trying to make it down in a very small chimney. And it's all well-meaning and fun. Until they find out you've been lying to them. And parents say, oh, this is no big deal. Kim believed until the age of 10 that the man could somehow make it through a stovepipe that was this big. And when that crumbled, she wondered what other things that she had been lied to about. Was the ark real? Was the crossing of the Red Sea real? Were the miracles of Jesus real? So there's an article in, um, in uh, the conversation, and it's talking about magical thinking in children. Children have a lot of interesting ways of how they put the world together upon what they see. Um, and so there's a, there's a developmental psychologist, her name is Jean um, Piaget, and she first documented magical thinking in children. And this is from the article. Um, and it typically should start to wane around age 10, sometimes a little earlier, sometimes a little bit later. Children will start to question the feasibility of the mechanisms that lie behind the connections they make. Can a man really travel around the entire world in just one night and deliver toys all the way around? How can a politician or a god influence the weather? Adults still have magical thinking. We just call it superstitions. Um, In medicine, we have it, so especially in certain places. In the OB ward, in the ER, um, and if your clinic is running slowly, if anyone says, wow, it's really quiet here, Everyone freaks out. Like if I were to say, wow, it's really quiet in the air. Oh, you can't say that. Right? And then they have all these things you have to do to counteract what I just said. Like somehow my words of saying, wow, it's really quiet, is going to be taken negatively by the universe and they're going to send all these people in like it was an invitation, like with the bat star. But some of you are thinking, oh no, but those are true. Some of you may believe in the law of attraction. I can just speak things into existence. Magical thinking. It's not biblical. It's magical thinking. But you probably don't do these. You don't cross your fingers. No knocking on wood. You have no problems walking under ladders while carrying a black cat, breaking a mirror. These things wouldn't bother you. 
You have a salt shaker at all times, so in case you have to... <laughs> right. You don't care that there are three-footed rabbits for your rabbit foot to rub on when you... In verse 15, he says, Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it at all. You know, when Jesus makes those statements, I think you should go, what? <laughs> um, what? Because a lot of people are saying it's pretty easy to get in there. Um, so, wait, hold on. This is like a requirement page. This is like what's, this is like, you, 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 like you, when you had to, if you're trying to get into some place, do I have the right ID? Do I have the right QR code? Do I have the right thing to get past? Remember when we were having to get back on island and you had to have the right QR code and had to turn green and all these kinds of things? Do I get to get on the airplane? Do I don't? Right? All those kinds of things. Well, truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child would not enter it at all. Well, that should be, huh, hmm. I was just playing off this whole thing by Kirk until he said this. It should get our attention, right? We must have childlike faith or what we call today magical thinking. We must believe that God the Father asked Jesus to come to earth to not only live a perfect life, but to be willing to die for his creation and be resurrected because of his perfect life so that men could be saved. You know, when we talk about Christi Christianity to other people, especially if you talk about it in, in um, educated areas, they'll say, oh, so do you believe in the tooth fairy as well? I suppose you believe in Santa Claus. That's what they'll say to us. But what God is saying is, is that I'm actually going to use the foolish things to confound the wise because they don't want to have childlike faith that they're willing to believe me and trust in me. And so they're not going to believe of all the things that I've done and all the things that I have said and all the things that I've asked. But this kind of faith of a child pleases me. And it's not like Jesus is taking people to heaven who don't want to go. If you want to come after me, you can deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. I'm not going to lie to you. It'll be hard, but I'll be with you always. And you'll have the power of the Holy Spirit, and you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Right? That's what I love about Jesus is he, he's never lied to us. He's never softened what it meant to be a follower. He's never deceived us. These beautiful examples of children give us this, this example of how we are to relate to God. Verse 16, he says, And he took them in his arms and began blessing them, laying his hands on them. It, it's interesting when you look up how Jesus blessed them. So the Greek word is eulogy where we get the word eulogy, which is what the speech we give when someone has died to talk about what their life was like. Remember when Isaac and um, Jacob gave blessings, what did they talk about? They talked about what their life was going to be like going forward. So when they asked for Jesus' blessing them, he's saying, this is what your life is going to be like. Let me tell you what. What was Mary told about? Mary was told about what her son's life would be like. And what this word means, it's to invoke the highest blessing. It's, a, it's not just like, oh, have a good day today. God bless you today. No, this is the blessing of over the rest of your life. What we prayed for for Carice was a blessing over the rest of her life. Her parents teaching her, people drawing around her. We prayed a blessing over the rest of her life. You know what I'd love to know? Is what the long story is about those kids that parents brought and Jesus blessed their lives. What did God do with those people? 
What are those, those parents who are willing to come and be ridiculed by the disciples? Like, no, Jesus is not seeing the children. No, no, we want Jesus to bless my child. What did Jesus do with those kids? Um, you know, when C.S. Lewis became a Christian, his colleagues made fun of him. And you know what they said? Oh, so do you believe in Santa Claus? That's what they said to him. You know what they also made fun of him about? Oh, yeah, Mr. Lewis, the one who writes children's books. This is what C.S. Lewis said about childish things. He said, when I became a man, I put away childish things, including the fear of childishness and the desire to be very grown up. Because what he realized is the wisdom, if we, the greatest sin is if we are puffed up and we have pride in our lives thinking we're all that. Oh, and I'm, I, I'm too important to deal with children. Oh, I'm, I'm the Messiah. We'll let the people who don't have important things to do take care of the children. You guys who work in the nursery and you work in the, in the work in children's church, it's a big deal what you do. The, the, the love, the truth that you pour in to this body's children is absolutely beautiful. It is a high work. It's not something that, oh, but if we could just at least get somebody to work into the, in, the, in the children's church, oh no, this is, a, this is a high calling of God that you can teach these children who very, very likely could be going home and teaching their parents a lot about the basics of Christianity that they learn in this church. Yeah, oh, to have childlike faith. Because if we don't have it, we don't get into heaven. Let's pray. You can stand with me. You know, I, you guys should be thankful because I didn't, I didn't make you stand for the whole service. You. you realize I stood for the whole service. <laughs> second time. Um, I was at a wedding recently, second time. I forgot to sit him down. I got all the way to the rings. <laughs> People kept doing this to me. I, I didn't know what that meant. <laughs> I'm not sure what the good hand signal was to sit the people down. They could have just say, sit them down. No, no, I went through 20 minutes of this before I realized I was supposed to sit them down. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I'm thankful that you have made it very clear what you're looking for. Is you just want that beautiful trust of a child. That we can hold your hand and you'll lead us. And no matter how hard it is, no matter how scary it is, no matter how we don't think we can go on, that you'll never leave us or forsake us, and you'll give us the power of your Holy Spirit to make it through. Lord, I pray you help us to examine our hearts, and do we have a childlike faith? Are we allowed, or, or, or do we believe in all the amazing things that you did, even if all of our smart friends say we're idiots? Help us not to be ashamed of you and all the beautiful miracles you performed. Lord, for a lot of us, we believe, help our unbelief. Send your spirit to reassure us. Hold us tighter sometimes, Lord. Let us always feel your hand. What is man that you even consider us? But you do. And let us all take advantage of that beautiful offer that you've given us is to come before you and cry out, Abba, Father. Lord, you've given us the opportunity to call you Daddy. What a beautiful, precious gift you've given us. 
And we thank you that you are the perfect Father. Father, we ask this in the power of the Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus, our blessed Christ. Amen. Um, Jesus wanted us to trust him on this. And it's probably the hardest thing that we have to do as we follow him. But he wanted us to trust him on this. As much as it seems unfair and as much as it seems hard, this is what he wanted us to do. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. God bless you guys.